y'all. Welcome to Miss Clark's chemistry class. I've been teaching chemistry for over 20 years and I am here to help you make sense of everything that you've learned in class. You went home, you're frustrated, you don't understand. That's why I'm here. This lesson is going to cover naming ionic compounds, but most specifically ionic compounds dealing with transition metals. If this is what you're looking for, go ahead and press the like button. If you were really looking for naming ionic compounds with main metals or polyatomic ions, I have all those tutorials for you in my description. Go check those out. I also have links to practice problems. So go get your notes, go get your periodic table, get something to write with, and let's get started. Okay, so if we're naming ionic compounds with transition metals, again, this is a binary naming system. Remember, binary, bi means two, nary means name. So this is a system that uses two names. If you find yourself with more than two names, you're doing it wrong. You only should have two names in your answer. Again, the first name is the metal, and this time we're talking about transition metals. Remember, the transition metals, those are groups three through 12. There are way more transition metals than I have on my periodic table. I just wrote in the most popular ones. These are going to be some of the ones that we're about to look at. But really and truly, all transition metals are all of these groups from 3 through 12. Let's remember something about transition metals. The transition metals have variable oxidation states. That means sometimes they have this many valence electrons, sometimes they have that many valence electrons. And it really depends on how many valence electrons you have to determine what the oxidation number is. Since the oxidation number is going to vary, we're gonna always use Roman numerals to tell us what the oxidation number is. Since the periodic table can't tell us what the oxidation number is, we need something to tell us what the oxidation number is, and that's what the Roman numerals are going to do. Let's review Roman numerals very quickly. When letter I is all by itself, that's a one. Double I, that's two. Triple I, that's three. IV is four, because V is five. So when the letter comes before, that means subtract. When the letter comes after, like in six, that means add. So IV is four and VI is six. VII is seven. V triple I is eight. Now again, X is 10. So when the I comes before the 10, that means one minus 10, so that's nine. I realize, we don't really teach Roman numerals so much anymore. So I went ahead and gave you one through 10. Go ahead and press pause right here so you can write these in your notes. Now you really only need a Roman numeral for those transition metals that have a varying oxidation number. There are a couple of transition metals that always have a very constant oxidation number. And when we're using those elements, you do not need a Roman numeral. We've got silver. Silver is always a plus one. Zinc and cadmium, always a plus two. Go ahead and write in those squares on your periodic table that silver is a plus one, zinc is a plus two, and cadmium is a plus two. Go ahead and pause if you need to do that. We have FeCl2. Fe, Fe, that's iron. It's a transition metal. We're going to need a Roman numeral. When we're using transition metals, you always have to identify the charge of the transition metal. We don't know iron's charge just by looking at the periodic table because it's a transition metal. But we can use chlorine to help. Because remember, for it to be an ionic compound, it must be neutral. So whatever chlorine's charge is, iron's charge must cancel that out. Chlorine is in group 17. It's a halogen, so it is a negative one, but we have two of them. So at this point, we know we have iron. We're going to need a Roman numeral to define iron's oxidation number, and we know that chlorine is going to be chloride. Well, there's two chlorines, and each chlorine is a negative one. So basically, chlorine is worth a negative two. We only have one iron. Iron must cancel that out. So iron must be a plus two. So that means iron, Roman numeral two, 
chloride. Because if iron is a plus two, that is going to cancel out two negative ones. Let's try that again. I know this can be quite confusing at first. So in the second example, we've got Cr2O. Cr is a transition metal. We do not know its oxidation number. We have to figure that out because once we figure it out, that's our Roman numeral. Now, we know that oxygen is a negative two. And let me show you a little shortcut for figuring out the oxidation number of the metal. We have one oxygen and each oxygen is a negative two. So we could multiply those together and divide by how many chromiums there are. So if we take negative two times one, that's a negative two. Divide by two, that's a one. Now you can ignore the charge because the metal is always a cation, positive, and the nonmetal is always an anion, negative. And since we're talking about figuring out the charge of chromium, it's always going to be a positive. And we decided that two times one is two, divided by two is one. So when we're writing the name chromium oxide and we need to figure out that Roman numeral, that Roman numeral is just going to be a one. Cu2S3. And if we look at Cu, copper, on the periodic table, we see that copper is a transition metal. We don't know its charge. We've got to figure it out. We know that Cu is copper and S is sulfur. So to figure out the charge on copper, we've got to use sulfur. Sulfur's charge is minus 2 because it's in group 16. So remember our shortcut. We're going to take the oxidation number of sulfur. We're going to multiply it by how many sulfurs we have. So 2 times 3, 2 times 3 is 6, divided by 2 is 3. So we know we're going to have copper, we need a Roman numeral, S is sulfide, and that Roman numeral is going to be 3. Now let's do one more example. At this point, you might be thinking, um, hello, I see the shortcut, even to the shortcut, all you have to do is uncrisscross. Now, that's true. You could just uncrisscross, but uncrisscrossing only gets you the right answer about 85% of the time. So if you're okay with an 85 in chemistry, go ahead, uncrisscross. Let me show you why it's important to do the multiply and divide shortcut that I showed you before. This is a great example to explain why this is a necessity. Because if we look at SnO2, Sn is 10, O is oxygen, so we've got 10 oxide. Even though 10 is over here in group 14, it's underneath the stair step, and 10 and lead both are both considered transition metals. So we do not know the charge on 10. Now we always know what the charge of the nonmetal is going to be, and oxygen is always a negative 2. So let's try our shortcut one more time, because if you uncrisscross, that means 10 is a 2. But that's not the right answer, so let's see. 2 times 2 is 4, divided by 1, still a 4. So if we prep this name, we've got 10, we know we're going to need a Roman numeral, oxide, and the Roman numeral that we're going to need is a 4. Now if we would have just uncrisscrossed, we would have used a 2 and we would have been wrong. That's why the multiply and divide shortcut always works 100% of the time. You should be a pro at naming ionic compounds dealing with transition metals. And hey, you got a side lesson on Roman numerals too. If you found this helpful, make sure and subscribe. Share it with your friend if your friends are struggling with chemistry as well. Until next time, bye y'all.